time. Listen to me, y'all. As Jesus is looking at the lamb being slain, as Jesus is looking at this lamb as the life being taken, he is realizing his life mission was to die. Did y'all catch what I just said? His life mission was to die. To die for the sins of the world. Amen, amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless us, Lord, as we open your word. Speak to us, Lord. Fill us. Teach us, instruct us, and draw us to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me, uh, let me forewarn you, you are going to want to hit the share button right now. Um, you're not going to want other people to miss what you are about to hear. Um, so... Let's, let's begin with a recap. By the way, uh, this is part two of the powerhouse of God, the powerhouse of God. And today's message is specifically on cross training, cross training. We, we learned last week that we live in a power hungry world. And because of that fact, because we live in a power hungry world, we, we ask the question, how should Christians relate to a power hungry world? And, and what we saw is, is that the Bible uh, uh, tells us that, that Christ instructs his followers, listen carefully, to also be power hungry. We saw last week that, that in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, we're not going to read through these texts at this point. We're just kind of recapping. We saw last week that God told, uh, Jesus told the disciples that they were to receive power after that the Holy Ghost had come upon them. Jesus's response, Jesus's preparation for the disciples was that they too should be power hungry. They were to plead for power. They were to pray for power. In fact, in the book of Luke chapter 24, and I believe it's verse 49, uh, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. And so we saw that Jesus is instructing his disciples that they were to pray for power. Put that in the chat for me, please. They were to pray for power. Now, now we know that he told them to go to Jerusalem and, and I want you to see this. In fact, I need to make this just a little bit bigger on the screen so y'all can see this for yourself. I want you to note this. Um, this word for pray. All right. Hopefully y'all can see that. This word for pray, you will see on the screen. It means to supplicate, to worship. But if you look at the, the where the word is derived from, you will see that there are three words there that are used to pray, to will, or to wish. And we're building upon this theme of wishing. When you wish for something, it means you really want it to happen. You, you're passionately wanting that thing to happen. And so what God was saying, what Jesus is saying, is that we are to wish, to pray for, to desire power. Psalms 143, verse 6. 
The Bible says there, I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. We saw that this verse gave us the idea, the feel for what it means to desire, to pray for, to wish for something. When you're wishing for water and you're super thirsty, that's how God desires us to wish, to wish when we pray, to pray for that power, to wish for power. Proverb, I'm sorry, Psalm 42, verse 2. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? We are to, we are to desire the power of God. We are to desire the presence of God. We are to wish for, wish for it as if we were thirsty in a dry land. We are to wish for it as though we needed water to save our lives. And so, we see that that on the day of Pentecost, this answer, this, the, this prayer is answered. The disciples are spending 10 days and what are they doing? They are wishing for power. They are wishing for power. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And we learned last week that in God filling this house with his power, he was indicating a much, a much more potent truth to his people that there was a high priest who was now seated in heavenly places in a heavenly sanctuary in God's heavenly power house to which we could go to access power. The book of Hebrews chapter 8 tells us of this heavenly sanctuary and of this high priest, Jesus, who sits there on our behalf. And so God is saying, you can come to my heavenly sanctuary. You can have access to that heavenly power house. We see, we remember in Revelation chapter 15, verse 8, the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And just pause right here for a second. I want you to understand that God's house is filled with his presence and therefore it is his power house. This is all recap. We're, we're, we're simply recapping here. I, I want you to note this because remember that we saw in Isaiah 56 where, where, where God speaking says, verse 7, these will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. So please note this carefully. God is calling the sanctuary his house of prayer. The reason why his sanctuary is his house of prayer is because that is where we get access to the power of God. So let's put it together. God's sanctuary is his powerhouse. How do we unlock the power in the powerhouse? It is through what everyone? Put it in the chat. It is through prayer. It is through prayer. We saw the articles of furniture in the sanctuary. We saw that these articles of furniture each represent an aspect of, of a very important part of the plan of salvation. In fact, a very important aspect of why the sanctuary is the power house of God. You'll remember, you'll remember the, the, the shocking truth we saw last week that when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he was teaching them about his house of prayer. Put a one in the chat if you remember that. He was teaching them. Remember when he said, uh, uh, after this manner, Matthew 6, 9, after this manner, pray. Remember, the altar of incense, which was located in the heart of the sanctuary, is what reminds us of prayer. The altar of incense was a symbol of prayer. So when Jesus said, after this manner, pray, he was pointing them to his house of prayer, of which 
The altar of incense is the center piece, meaning it is the piece located directly in the center of the sanctuary. You'll remember that as we went on to look at that prayer, we saw this. After this manner, pray the altar of incense. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We saw that that directs us to the most holy place, to the throne of God, which is the Ark of the Covenant. Let's keep going. Verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, we saw that the candlestick is a representation of God's kingdom on earth. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it may give light to all that are in the house. So we saw that that directed us to the candlestick. And then the very next verse, give us this day our what? Daily bread. We saw that that verse pointed us to the table of showbread. That verse pointed us to the word of God. Why is Jesus teaching us to pray through the sanctuary? Let's keep moving. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That is exactly what the labor was about. It was about the washing away of sins, the forgiving of debt. And then watch this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That was what Christ came to this world to do. His death on the cross is what delivered us from darkness. And as a result of this, beloved, we are seeing that Christ was leading his disciples to pray through the sanctuary. This is his powerhouse. In fact, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that this sanctuary is, in essence, the very character of Christ. We might say it this way, when you're looking at the, these, these symbols in the sanctuary, you are looking at the very mind of Christ. I see someone asking in the chat, what is a sanctuary? The sanctuary is, was that building in the Old Testament that God instructed Moses to make. Remember, in this building, God was basically demonstrating the plan of salvation. So every day a lamb was sacrificed, pointing to the sacrifice of Christ. And the priests would wash their hands and their feet. Uh, at the laver, which was another article of furniture. If you can see it on the screen, that's the second article of furniture. It symbolized baptism and the table of showbread right up in the, in what was called the holy place. It pointed to the word of God. The altar of incense pointed to the seventh, to the, to, to the, to the symbol of prayer and the candlestick pointed to letting one's light shine. And then you get up into that most holy place where you have the law of God. God was demonstrating, this is the path back to me. If I want to be redeemed, I've got to accept the sacrifice of Christ. I've got to be born again, the labor. I've got to eat the word of God, the table of showbread. I've got to be in constant communion with him, the altar of incense. I've got to let my light shine, the candlestick. And I have to keep his commandments, the Ark of the Covenant. This is what the sanctuary pointed to. And so now I want you to watch this very carefully. Because what we're about to see, what I just said to you, is that this sanctuary is in essence the very mind of Christ. Christ is trying to teach us how to think. He's trying to teach us how. So last week when we talked about the desire to pray, Christ is trying to demonstrate, look, watch me as the example. I, I want to show you how to pray. Watch me. See my desire for prayer? That needs to be your desire for prayer. And so last week we spent much time talking about the, the uh, asking for prayer power, asking for, for the power to, uh, to desire the will of God. 
That's what we talked about last week. The altar of incense, that was the first article that we went into detail on. And we showed that God was trying to show us that if we want to become stronger Christians, remember, the sanctuary is the powerhouse of God. This is where Christians get should get their strength training. Think of that sanctuary as a gym. And God is saying, listen, the first article of furniture, the first piece of equipment that I need you to work out at is the altar of incense. I need you to learn how to pray. I need you to learn how to desire, how to wish for righteousness, how to wish. Because if your wish for righteousness is not strong enough, you're not going to be able to handle the other pieces of furniture that unlock further power from God. Put a one in the chat if you're following me. God says the first thing I need you to do, I need you to understand the power of prayer. I need you to understand the power of your wish, of your desire. I need you to pray for a stronger desire. I need you to pray for a greater desire. Now, Matthew chapter seven, verse seven, the Bible says this, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Now, what do you think that means? What do you think that means? Ask, seek, knock. What is that? When we think about that verse, what, what do we know Jesus is talking about here? He's talking about prayer. So prayer is the act of seeking God. Now, now I want the reason I'm pointing this out to you is because I want you to know here, I want you to know in Revelation chapter 9, verse 6, this same word seek, remember, ask and it shall be seek and you shall find. The same word seek is used in Revelation 9, verse 6. And I want you to check out how it's used. It says, and in those days, and don't worry about what this text means right now. This is a whole, this is a prophecy where I'm just using this text to show you as an example. And in those days shall men Seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So to seek would be the same thing as desire. Are you with me? To seek would be the same thing as to desire. So if to pray means to seek God's face, then it's the same thing as to desire. God wants us to have a strong desire. That's what we get at the altar of incense. When we learn how to use that altar of incense, when we learn how to pray, remember, we pray for everything else but a desire for righteousness. God says the most important thing I need you to pray for is a desire. Remember, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness because they shall be what? They shall be filled. So once we, once we understand that the altar of incense is leading us to desire, to pray, Lord, give me a stronger desire to walk after you. Give me a stronger desire to do your will. Give me a stronger desire to pray. Because right now I don't have that desire. Other things easily distract me from you. So Lord, strengthen my desire. Once you begin to pray, strengthen my desire. Yeah, the devil is on a rampage, boy. Once, once you begin to pray, uh, Lord, strengthen my desire. The next question is, where does God want you to direct that desire? And beloved, this is where I'm going to need you all to focus in. Watch, watch, watch with me. Because the bottom line is we ought to desire what Jesus desired. Amen? Whatever it is that Jesus desired is what we ought to desire as well. So the question is, what did Jesus desire? Is there anything that we can look at in the scripture and see, yeah, Jesus desired this. And I want to show you one of the few places where Jesus actually used the word desire. Watch. It's in Luke 22, verse 15. And here's what Jesus said. He said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
Now, I want you to think about this. If Jesus desires something, how, how much does he want it? Just, just think with me for a moment. Jesus says, with desire have I desired. He didn't just say, I have desired. He says, with desire, I have desired. It's almost like a double desire. With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. <clears throat> now, what do you think Jesus is saying here? Come on, put it in the chat. What do you think he's saying? Now, remember, Jesus had, uh, had other Passovers with the disciples before. Why is he desiring this one? What is he desiring? It's as if he's saying, look, I've been waiting for this. Well, I've been waiting for what? I hope y'all are sitting down because what you're about to hear is going to change. It's going to change a whole lot for you. It's going to change a whole lot for you. I promise you. Listen, what is Jesus desiring to eat the Passover? Can I ask you a question? What does the Passover represent? What did the Passover represent? The Passover pointed to the, the death of the Lamb. Please listen to that. Very good. The Passover pointed to Jesus' death. And Jesus is saying, with desire, I have desire. Because this is the one. This, what's about to happen, I have been waiting for. Mm, mm, mm. Let, let me say that again. Jesus is saying, I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for what? Come on, y'all. What has he been waiting for? I have been waiting. Ah, uh, Gia, yes. He desired unto death for our salvation. Check this out. Let me rephrase that. Jesus was saying, I have been looking forward to the moment that I get to die for you. I need y'all to just focus on that just for a second. <clears throat> do you understand? Do you understand what you just heard? Jesus so how many of you ever desire something like, man, I can't wait to go on vacation? Anybody know what it is to desire to go on vacation? <clears throat> like when you get in your vacation, oh man, I have desired, I have desired for this moment that we get to go on vacation, right? Oh, I've been looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this. I've been waiting for this moment for what seems like an eternity. <laughs> Jesus says, I have desired, I have been waiting for this moment because what? Then he says, listen, the next time I eat this with you, it will be in heaven. Now, you got to understand what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, look, <laughs> this is our last meal together because the next one we eat together is going, you guys are going to be with me in heaven and I have been looking forward to that and I know that the means by which you get to heaven is my death so I have been looking forward to executing this oh man I've been looking forward to executing this so that you will get to eat with me in heaven y'all get to come to my home Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Now, I need you to catch this because how many of you are struggling mentally right now? Wait a minute. He was looking forward to his death? Hmm. See, that's that attitude. Now, nah, nah, listen to me, man. That attitude 
it is one that we're not used to. See, see, you're going to see where I'm going in a moment because I need you to understand that, that in order for us, see, let me, let me say it this way. We don't look forward to our death, do we? How many of you look forward to your death? I, I need you to note Jesus' attitude towards his death. Mm, mm, mm. See, beloved, I can tell you that many of us do not have that attitude. Death, oh, Jesus is looking forward to it. Why? Because he knows that it is the means whereby mankind will be saved. So he is, he is looking, watch, watch, watch. Watch what Adam Clark says. Adam Clark, commentator, notice what Adam Clark says on this very text. With desire, I have desired. A Hebraism, for I have desired more earnestly. Our Lord's meaning seems to be that having purpose to redeem a lost world by his blood, he ardently longed for the time in which he was to offer himself up. Oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. wait a minute, y'all. Does God call us to die to self? Yes or no? Put it in the chat. If God, if, if you understand the fact that God calls us to die to self. Yes or no? One in the chat, if he desires us to die to self. Come on. Come on. Yes, yes. You're saying, I see yes, I see yes, I see yes, I see yes. Now, let me ask you, what is your attitude towards dying to self? <laughs> I, I, I think the sermon's done now. <laughs> we, we can wrap it up right here. Do y'all catch this? Our attitude to dying to self is like, oh, oh man. Ooh. Ooh, it's not something I'm looking forward to, but it must be done. No, that wasn't Jesus's attitude. His attitude, his attitude was one of longing, one of I can't wait. Can you imagine the difference in our Christian walk, beloved, if we had that attitude towards our own death? Are y'all catching what I'm saying? Is this, are you understanding? Our desire to die to self must be that of Jesus' desire as he was going to the cross. Let me show you how bad did Jesus want this? How much did he want? He was desiring his death. Why? Let me show you why. Why was he desirous of, desirous of death? Listen, Hebrews 9.15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Do you see that? It was the, by the means of death that Christ would redeem the world. And so, yes, he is looking forward to it. Yes, he is desiring it. It is not something that he's like, man, watch, watch. I know what y'all thinking right now. I know where your mind is going right now. Don't go there yet. I need you to see this. Jesus longed with longing. He was dead set on going to the cross. He was determined to go to the cross. And, and I want you to understand that what this leads to, beloved, what I want you to see here is that this is pointing us to the altar of sacrifice. So watch this. The altar of incense, which we talked about last week, God is saying, I need you to pray for a stronger desire. Desire for what, Lord? I just need you to pray for a stronger desire for you to do my will. Well, what is your will? I'll tell you in a moment. But right now, we're coming into the gym today. We're coming into the sanctuary, and I just want you to begin to pray for a stronger desire. 
Lord, can you tell me why? I just need you to pray for a desire that is so strong, a wish, a wish that is so strong that, that it overpowers everything else for you. So, so pray for that desire. All right, Lord, I'm, I'm at the altar of incense and I've been spending the last week, the last month. And I, I, every time I pray, I'm praying, Lord, give me stronger desire. Just give me a stronger passion. Give me a stronger desire to do what you asked me to do. Just give me that strong desire. And now he said, all right, you, you're, you're learning about this altar of incense. Now I'm going to take you to the altar of sacrifice. Because in order for you to go through with your death, <laughs> you're going to have to have a desire for it. Not just a passing desire, but a desire that is stronger than life itself. Oh man, come on, I need you, I need you to catch this. Watch, let me demonstrate for you how badly Jesus was wanted this, how much he was set on it. Listen, Luke 12, verse 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? What does that mean? We look at the KJV, how am I straightened till it be accomplished? We know he's talking about his death here. But I have a baptism to be baptized with. He's talking about his death, and he says, I am straightened till it be accomplished. Well, what does that mean? Let me give it to you in a different translation. Watch. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it be accomplished. In other words, I can't wait for this thing to happen. I cannot wait for it to be done. Here's another one. There's a kind of baptism that I must suffer through. I feel very troubled until it is finished. Come on, man. I want this thing done. You hear him saying, over my time is not yet come. <laughs> how about this one? I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Man, I need this thing to be accomplished. Yes, yes, yes. Watch. Please follow me. Remember this. Remember where Jesus, come back with me to where Jesus first discovers his mission. How many of you remember, where did Christ first discover his mission? Let me see if you can tell me. Don't look at the, I was going to tell you don't look at the screen, but you can't help but look at the screen. So go ahead. It's right there on the screen. Where does Christ first discover his mission? It is at the age of 12 when he goes into the sanctuary, the temple. In Luke 21, verse 41 onward, it describes Jesus at the age of 12. He's going to the temple. His parents lose him. And then when they find him, it says in verse Luke 2, verse 48, and when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? This is where Jesus first learns of his mission when he is looking at the temple services. And I love the way this book, The Desire of Ages, puts it. Listen to what it says here. For the first time, the child Jesus looked upon the temple. He saw the white robed priests performing their solemn ministry, the bleeding victim on the altar of sacrifice. He witnessed the impressive rites of the Pascal service. Day by day, he saw their meaning more clearly. Every act seemed to be bound up with his own life. New impulses were awakening within him. Silent and absorbed, he seemed to be studying out a great problem. The mystery of his mission was opening up to the Savior. Wrapped in contemplation of the scenes, when the Paschal service ended, he lingered in the temple, and when the worshipers departed from Jerusalem, he was left behind. Listen to me, y'all. As Jesus is looking at the lamb being slain, as Jesus is looking at this lamb, as the life being taken, he is realizing his life mission was to die. 
Did y'all catch what I just said? His life mission was to die. To die for the sins of the world. Pauline, I see your question. <laughs> Don't worry, I am coming to that. Jesus in the temple realizes that he's been called into the world to die for the world. His mission, listen carefully to me, his mission is to die. So when he goes into the temple for the first time, when he begins his ministry at the age of 30, the Bible says uh, in Luke 4, 17, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The question is, how was he going to set at liberty them that were bruised? Beloved, very simple, by his death on the cross. So Jesus at the age of 12 realizes I've been sent into this world to die for the sins of the world, to set the world free. And now he's on a mission and that mission is to complete his father's business, which required the death of, of himself, of himself. Let me ask you, does the Bible say of Jesus, I delight to do thy will? When Jesus speaking of his father, I delight to do thy will. Come on. I need you to follow this. Watch, watch. So let me show you because <laughs> some of y'all wonder, well, what about Gethsemane? I'm coming there. Notice with me, Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, pause for a second. <clears throat> pause for a second. So... Jesus has just told his disciples, I am going to be killed. And then the disciples are like, and Peter's like, no, 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 no. This can't happen to you. And I, I need you to check how Jesus, resp Jesus responds as if he is offended and he is offended. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Do you see this? Jesus literally responds like, how dare you try to stop me from accomplishing my mission? Jesus was set on the cross, beloved, and I need you to understand the reason I'm trying to paint this picture is because I want you to compare your view of death to self with Jesus's view of death to self. He was determined. He was set. He was looking forward to it. He was like, come on, let's go get this thing done. But many of us are like, oh, man. <sighs> <sighs> Oh boy, today is a day to die to self. No, beloved, Jesus knew, he knew what was at stake. And he was looking forward to the sacrifice so much so that when his disciples tried to stop him, he didn't was like, he wasn't like, yeah, you know, me. he was like, no, nope, get behind me, Satan. How about this? Luke 9, 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. That is, he should die. Watch. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Y'all know what steadfastly means? He, ste he was determined. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Steadfast. To set fast. That is literally to turn resolutely in a certain direction. Or to figuratively, to confirm, to fix, to establish, to strengthen, to set. 
Jesus steadfastly went forward to his death. How many of us, when we hear that we need to die to self, steadfastly, with joy that is, that is set before us, endure that? How many of us are actually looking forward to the death of self? How many of us want it so bad that nothing can get in between us and it? How many of us? John 17, 1. Then these words, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify. Jesus understood, beloved, that this death was, 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 was about glory. And that's why he was looking forward to it. The hour is come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. He was looking forward to the moment. And yes, it was a painful thing. Don't get me wrong. Gethsemane is there. But we're going to see why in a moment. But what I need you to understand, beloved, is very simply that Jesus was intent, was bent, was determined, was steadfastly set on going to the cross. And that is the very attitude we must have Remember when the woman came and anointed his feet and they were all like, you know, why this waste? And Jesus was like, she's done this unto my death. It was a moment of glorification for him. It was a moment. He, it was, he was like, she understands. She understands my mission. She understands my calling. She understands my purpose. And he was steadfastly about it. Now, watch this. Watch this. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and saith to his disciples, sit ye here and pray while I sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be very sorrowful. Then saith unto them, he then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples and find them asleep and saith unto Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is what? Is weak. He went again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came again and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went again, uh, went again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Now, let's pause for a moment. Is Jesus trying to get out of dying? What do y'all think? Is Jesus trying to get out of dying? Listen, y'all, what Jesus feared was the separation of his father's presence. That's what he feared. And, and in spite of that fear, Jesus's desire, watch this, Jesus's desire to redeem mankind, meaning his desire to go to the cross and die was stronger than, than the flesh, which was like, oh, uh, you know. You see, remember, beloved, Jesus came to be tempted in every point as we are. I like what Sandra just said. His flesh was weak because of the separation of his father. And despite that, watch this, his desire to do the will of God was greater than the weakness of his flesh. Do I need to say that again? His desire to die was greater than his desire to live. Did y'all catch that just now? Let me say it again. His desire to die was greater than his desire to live. And Jesus is trying to demonstrate something for us. I'm about to put a formula upon the screen. It is a divine formula. And it is this P 
equals DDS, which is greater than DLS. What in the world, Pastor? Listen, P represents power. Power is when the desire, D, to die, D, to self, is greater than the desire to live for self. Did you all catch that just now? Power is when the desire to die to self is greater than the desire to live for self. So we put it in an equation. P equals DDS, which is greater than DLS. Power. Y'all want power, right? We want Christian strength training. How do I get stronger? Jesus says, the first thing I need you to do is I need you to start praying for desire because you need desire to unlock the power of the other articles of furniture, beginning with the altar of sacrifice. If your desire to die is not greater than your desire to live, you're not going to be able to unlock, to access the power of the cross, the powerhouse of God. Let me say it again. Your desire to die to self must be greater than your desire to live for self. And that's why Jesus starts us at the altar of incense. I just want you to pray for power. Remember in the, in the old karate movie, wax on, wax off. Why do I keep waxing on and waxing off? Because there's coming a time where you will see how that is able to defend you. So right now, I just want you to learn how to pray for desire. Pray for desire. Yes, pray for a stronger desire. Pray for a desire that is so great that nothing can quench it. And as you begin to grow stronger in desire, now he says, I'm going to train you how to be CrossFit. <laughs> uh, now you're ready for cross training. Now you're ready to train at this piece of furniture right here, at this piece of equipment in my gym, in my powerhouse, and that is the cross. P equals DDS, which is greater than when, D, when DDS is greater than DLS. We must desire to die to self above desiring to live for self. How bad did Jesus want it? His desire to die. Watch this. His desire to die was greater than the sense of betrayal. Remember this? Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign. Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. I need you to understand that Jesus at this moment could have been like, What? You betrayed me? Forget it. I ain't dying for none of y'all. But his desire to die was greater than the offense exercised toward him. How many of you, when you're offended by something, something someone does to you, the, the desire to self overpowers the desire to die? Come on, y'all. Jesus' desire to die was greater than the sense of betrayal, than the sense of offense. His desire to die was greater than his desire for deliverance. Let me break it down. Matthew 26, 52. Then said Jesus unto him, put up again your sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? Oh, man. Y'all need to understand, Jesus could have prayed for deliverance from death. But he didn't. He didn't. He knew he had to die to set an example for us to help us understand that we have to die. <laughs> How many of us are like, Lord, I don't want to die. Lord, deliver me from death. Deliver you from death? He's telling you that you need to die. Our desire to die must be greater than our desire for deliverance. 
Mm, mm. Not only that, look, his desire to die was greater than his than 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 anger at false testimony because he could have been very angry. Wait a minute. Matthew 26, 6, 60. But th they found no witnesses. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. And at the last came two false witnesses. And they said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. How many how many of you ever had someone say falsely something falsely about you? And your desire to live overpowers your desire to die. Your desire to live overpowers your desire to die. Watch y'all. I'm going somewhere with this and you need to understand it because Jesus is trying to show us what it means. The kind, the level of desire we must have in order to die. What about this? His desire to die was greater than the spirit of retaliation. Remember when they started hitting Jesus and spitting on him? He could have been like, you know what? I ain't dying for y'all. I'm not dying for you. Y'all doing what? Y'all spitting? Nope. Nope. His desire to die, beloved, was greater than the spirit of retaliation. And God is trying to get us to understand this. His desire to die was greater than his desire to not be forsaken of his father. Remember when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He, right there, he could have been like, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, I don't like this feeling of not being, and I, I, I'm getting off the cross. Nope. He knew the end game, John. He knew the end game. His desire to die was so great. I need you to understand that Satan is putting all of these blocks in his way to get him to be like, yeah, I don't want to die. But his desire to die, his longing to complete the plan of salvation was greater than anything the devil could do to stop him from completing his mission. And so now you begin to understand, beloved, that, that this is the same kind of desire that we must have. Watch this. Remember in John 19, 30, when the Bible says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished and bowed his head and gave him the ghost. So watch this. You know, we're like this. When we hear it is finished, we think it's like Jesus was like, oh, it is finished. No, 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 no. I need you to understand that that it is finished was the it is finished of. It was the it is fin it was the victory shout of divinity. It is the hands raised like, yes, it is finished. I did it. It is done. The plan of salvation has been completed at the cross. It is finished. <laughs> oh, man, it was the battle cry. It was a cry of joy, of excitement. My death has been accomplished. Yes. Oh, man. Listen, listen, listen. I like the way uh, our high calling, another powerful book puts it. When Jesus on the cross, when on the cross, Jesus uttered the cry, it is finished. Glory and joy thrilled heaven and discomfiture fell on the confederacy of evil. After that triumphant cry, the world's redeemer bowed his head and died. But by his death, he was a conqueror and he opened the gates of eternal glory so that all who believe in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. I need you to catch this. <laughs> it, was a, it was a shout of joy, of victory. Beloved, we ought to be rejoicing over our death. It is finished. Yes. My death has been accomplished. Oh man, I need you to understand Christ demonstrated this formula. Listen, Christ demonstrated that the formula for power is that your desire to die must be greater than your desire to live. Let me say it again. Your desire to die must be greater than your desire to live. But let me put it in Jesus' own words. Who said, if any man will come after me 
Let him deny himself and take up his cross, altar of sacrifice. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Did y'all catch that? <laughs> your desire to die must be greater than your desire to live. You must be willing to, not just willing, you must be desirous of dying to self greater. Your desire to die to self must be greater than your desire to live for self. So the reason Christ needs us to pray, to desire, to have a strong desire is so that the strong desire be turned to the cross. Right? Our desire to die must be greater than our desire to live for self. Without a working altar of incense, you cannot have a working altar of sacrifice. Do I need to say that again? If you are weak at the altar of incense, you don't stand a chance at the altar of sacrifice. God says, I need you. The first thing we're going to work on, you're weak right now. You know, you're, you're, scr you're a scrawny Christian. The first thing we need to work on is we need to work on your desire power. Once your desire power gets above the, the, the weakness of the flesh, now we can go ahead and unlock the power at the altar of sacrifice and the power at the table of showbread and the power at the altar of incense and the power at the, at the seven branch candlestick. Now we can begin to unlock this power, but without exercising at the altar of incense, you cannot possibly bear the cross. You become too weak. Beloved, this is why Jesus said the willingness, this is why we must understand the willingness of the spirit must be greater than the weakness of the flesh. Let me say it again, y'all. The willingness of the spirit must be greater than the weakness of the flesh. So when Jesus himself is, 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 is asking the question between my will and God's will and the flesh is trying to rise up, what does he do? What is he doing in the garden? What is he doing in the garden? When he comes face to face with this issue, beloved, where does he turn to? He turns to the altar of incense to gain power over the flesh. That's what he was doing in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> he was at the altar of incense in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, make thy will stronger than the weakness of the flesh. All right, come on, watch this. We're about to bring this, we're about to bring this right to you. I need you to watch this. So the Bible says, then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then he says these words, rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at a hand that doth betray me. Now, put a one in the chat if you're familiar with this text. Rise, let us be going. Rise, let us be going. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus said, rise, let us be going, uh, 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 the altar of incense signifies prayer. I see you asking the question. The altar of incense signifies prayer. That's what Jesus was doing in the Garden of Gethsemane. All right. So, so watch this. Follow this. So Jesus says, rise, let us be going. Let us be going where? How many of you have the picture? Be honest now. Be honest. This, I'm going to ask you to put a two in the chat. How many of you get the picture that Jesus is like, all right, come on, let's go. Because the people that are, that are coming to get me, they're here. We need to go. How many of you get that picture? Come on, we need to go. We need to get going because they're here. Put a, put a two in the chat if you have kind of subconsciously had that thought. Yeah, we need to get out of here, right? Come on, y'all. Let's get out of here. Come on. Be honest. Why is he saying rise? Let us be going. <laughs> Do you think Jesus is saying rise? 
Let's get out of here. Let's escape. Do you think that's what he's saying? Let us be going. <laughs> Do you think that's? Yes, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Can we put that on the screen? Yeah. Rise. Let us be going. Going where? Going to my destiny. Going to meet the betrayers, not running away from them. Come on, y'all. Think about that. <laughs> He's not saying rise, let's escape. He's saying rise, let us. Now watch this. What? He doesn't say rise, I need to go. He says rise, let us be going. Now it's clear that Peter's probably thinking Jesus means let's escape because when the people come, when the guards come, what does he do? He pulls out a sword, right? Because he's like, we got to escape. But notice this, y'all. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus says, rise, let us be going. Now, what is Jesus thinking when he says, rise, let us be going? So remember when, when, when Lazarus died? Remember when Lazarus died? And they, the disciples got the news that Lazarus died. And then, and then notice John 11, verse 6. Watch this, y'all. Watch, watch, watch. Pay attention to the text. Watch. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, he saith to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Now watch this. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? And Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in a day? If a man walk in the day, he stumbles not, but he see the light of darkness. Now watch this. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because he, there is no light in him. Now watch what Peter says, what Thomas says. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also what? Put it in the chat. Let us also what? <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. I was excited about this message. When I, I was excited, y'all. I was excited when I rise. No, Peter says, or, or Thomas says, let us go. Let us also go. That we may what? Die with him. That's what the disciples told Jesus, right? Remember when, 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 when Peter, they were having that, that supper and, and, and the Lord said unto Simon, Behold, Satan has desired to sift you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to what? To go. <laughs> I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to die. So when Jesus says, rise, let us be going. He's like, all right, y'all said y'all were with me, right? Let's, let's do this. Come on, y'all. Let's do this. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying to us right now. Rise, let us be go. go let's be going. Go where? To the cross. You said you, were, you said you were willing to die, right? If that's what you told me. What do the disciples do? Huh. Matthew 26, 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And that's what we do, y'all. That's what we do. When it comes time to die to self, we forsake Christ and we flee because we don't want that. Now, I'm not looking forward to my death. They didn't want to die. So they fled. They ran. How many of us do that very thing? And, and then watch this. And then because we feel guilty, we follow him. But from afar, remember what Peter did? Matthew 26, 58. But Peter followed him afar off. Onto the high priest's palace. And Peter, Peter was like, well, you know what? I mean, he, how many of us are following Christ afar off? Because we don't want to, we don't want to be seen with, we don't want to get too close to him because that means that we will have to die too. And that's what they were thinking. If, if we're close to him, we will die too. Beloved, that is the truth. If you are close to Christ, if you are close to Christ, you must die too. Now, I'm going to tell you, those disciples would not have died. They're, they would have. But imagine had they been like, Jesus, we're sticking with you. No, we're going with you. And 
the Roman soldiers, I'm just speaking probably, they would have, they would, or the Jews would have been like, no, nah, we don't want you. This is the one we want. We want to crucify him. I mean, getting one person crucified was hard. We want to crucify him. They weren't concerned with the disciples. They didn't see any power in the disciples. But imagine had the disciples been like, Lord, we will not forsake you. You're going to die. Let us go also with you. I need, you I need you to understand this, beloved, that, that this thing, this, this cross training, so many of us are not ready for it because of our attitude towards death to self. And let me clarify that. I'm not, please don't anyone take this message and go, pastor said I should go die. I'm not, <laughs> understand the spiritual context. When Jesus talks about dying to self, he's talking about putting the old man to death. He's saying to us, rise, let us be going. Now watch this, y'all. If, if, if it was in the sanctuary that Christ discovered his life mission, and that life mission was that he was to die for the sins of the world, then it is in the sanctuary that we discover our life mission, which is to die for the righteousness of Christ. Let me say that again. <laughs> It was in the sanctuary where Christ discovered his life mission, which was to die for the sins of the world. It is in the sanctuary that we discover our life mission, which is to die for the righteousness of Christ. How bad do you want it? Can anything get in between you and the death of self? Can a girl stop you? Can a guy stop you? Can marijuana stop you? Can a drink stop you? Can money stop you? Can fame stop you? Can the world stop you? Is there anything that can stop you from your life mission, which is to die? <clears throat> to die to self. This is what it means, beloved, to cross train, to be cross fit. Oh, listen, I promise you, we're getting ready to wrap this up. I promise you, we're getting ready to wrap this up. I need you to listen to this. Your death to self is as significant as Christ's death for you. Let me say that again. I think that will be the most powerful thing that I say today. Your death to self is as significant as Christ's death death for you. Why? Because it is part of the equation of salvation. See, I need you to understand this. In Galatians 2.21, Paul said this, I do not frustrate the grace of God. So let me ask you, can you frustrate the grace of God? Can the grace of God be frustrated? Yes. But look, look at what he goes on to say. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So, so are there situations in which Christ's death can be in vain? The answer is yes. Right? If you try to get righteousness aside from Christ and, and just through the law, then Christ's death for you is vain. Christ's death on a whole is not in vain and it never will be. But you can make it vain for yourself. In the same way, beloved, listen to me. Christ died so that you can die to self. And so if you refuse to die to self, you have made Christ's death in vain for you. It will mean nothing for you. It, it will not result in eternal salvation because you refuse to be born again. You refuse to take up the cross and follow Jesus. So, so as significant as his death is on the cross, it's as significant as your death is to him. He is looking with the same urgency for your death as he did the death of his son. All right, my son died for you. Now, will you die for him? Because if you don't die for him, then he died for you in vain. And so what happens, beloved, is we take our death to self so lightly. We're just like, you know, oh yeah, death to self, death to self. We don't realize the significance in the eyes of God to the, in regards to the death of self. God is looking with the same intent, with the same passion, 
in the death of his son, he is looking to see, will you die? Will you put self to death through my power in you? See, <clears throat> uh, Jesus said it this way. He said, except, verily, verily, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see the kingdom of God unless you die to self and are born again. And the Bible says, know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So our death, beloved, is the response to what Christ did for us on the cross. That's why it's so important. God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. So that's a definition of love. And the Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. So his love <coughs> was the example for us. Hey, I loved you so much, I'm willing to die for you. Our response is, Jesus, I love you so much because you love me so much that I'm willing to die for you. That's what he's asked. So when he says to us, rise, let us be going. He's saying, take up your cross and follow me. Now you need to see this because the Bible says, the Bible says, let me get here. John 10, 17. Uh, uh, Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. And no man take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it up again. I need you to understand, beloved. You need power to lay your life down. You can't just lay your life down on your own. You need power. And only Christ has that power. So, when I begin to pray, see, every day, when I die, like the death is, a, death is not a small thing. <clears throat> I'm moving away from my slides. I, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to freestyle the rest of this. All right. And then we're done. Do you know that we have the record of Paul's death? And if you know how Paul died, who knows how Paul died? Did you know that Paul's death was recorded in the scriptures? Did y'all know that? <laughs> it's recorded in Acts 9. So he's, he's, on, he's on this horse and he's on this road and he's, he, he's, he's on his way to persecute some Christians when he meets Jesus. And he dies. Did y'all know that? He died. He died in Acts chapter 9. <laughs> uh, are y'all following this? Paul didn't die slowly. He died in Acts 9. And watch, th watch this. His death was... His death signified that the old Paul, the old Saul, was no longer there. That's what death is. Death is not a slow process. Death, the death to self, is meant... To be an event as significant as the cross. Every day we ought to get up and realize the depth of what it means for, for that old man to die. Yes, he, Paul died. He couldn't see. He didn't eat. And when he came back to life, he was a new man. Have you died? Did you die? Have you died? That's the question you need to walk away from this. Have I died? Or have I just been buried alive? I'm going to end with this quote. I'm going to end with this quote. I'm just going to skip these slides. Skip these slides. Last quote here. Here it is. Last quote. From a book called Manuscript Releases, page 51, volume 12, it says this. Joining the church is not a sure evidence that a man has joined himself to Christ. 
The new birth is a rare experience in this age. This is the reason why there are so many perplexities in the churches. Many, so many who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. They have been baptized, but they were buried alive. Self did not die, and therefore they did not rise to newness of life in Christ. Have you died? There should be one major death in your life. There should be one major death for you. That death should signify that that old man is gone. And then from then on, every day you're experiencing these born again experiences. And, and every day uh, you become better, stronger, faster. <laughs> Every day, beloved, as you are working out at the cross, as you are working out at the labor, as you are working out at the altar of incense, you become, God is rebuilding you. He is making you better, stronger. <laughs> when your desire to die to self is greater than your desire to to live for self. You know that you are in the right place with God. You know that you are in the right place with the Holy Spirit. And beloved, as we continue this series, I need you to understand, here's what we've learned so far. I'm not going to recap. All I'm telling you is this. God needs us to start at the altar of incense to begin to pray for desire. And my appeal to you for this week, every week we've been preaching, we, we have a call to action. And the call to action this week is very simple. Lord, increase my desire so that my desire to die to self is greater than that my desire to live for self. For the next seven days, that's what I want you to pray. Lord, strengthen my desire so that my desire to die to self is greater than my desire to live for self. And what God is going to do, beloved, is he's going to give you moments to exercise the cross. Moments to exercise the cross, to exercise that dying to self, that daily dying in the little things, in medium things, in big things. But what he will do is he will strengthen you to bear the cross. If that's your, if, is that your desire? I want you to rate, put, a, put a one in the chat. This is my desire. Lord, teach me, teach me to become strong at the altar of sacrifice. So for the next seven days, as you're praying, because God's house is a house of prayer, he's teaching us to pray at every article. Not only am I going to start praying for a stronger desire, but now I'm going to add to that a desire that I will die, to a desire to die to self joyfully, that that desire will be stronger than the weakness of the flesh, that that desire will be stronger to, 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 uh, to live for self. Every week, we're going to be adding something new to our prayer. Every article of furniture is going to add something new to our prayer. So instead of us going into prayer and we just pray for our laundry list of, you know, Lord, do this and Lord, do this and Lord, provide for that. Da, 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 we're going to start praying how God asked us to pray. Hmm. I'm excited, y'all. I hope, I hope that y'all are catching the significance of this word. I hope your attitude towards the death of self will be changed forever. Pray for that joy. Pray for that longing. Pray for that desire for self to die. For the old man to be put away. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for speaking to us. We thank you again, Lord, for demonstrating to us why 
your sanctuary is a house of prayer and a house of power. Lord, as we begin to navigate these articles of furniture and apply them to our everyday lives, as we, as we take what we learned last week about the altar of incense and praying for desire, praying for greater desire, and now learning that our desire to die must be, must be greater than our desire to live for self. Lord, please implement that into our prayer life. That our minds may become like the mind of Jesus. Give us his desire and his passion. Give us his desire to go to the cross. Because without it, Lord, we cannot do what he did. Bless us to this end, Heavenly Father. We pray it in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen and amen.